Welcome back for week seven of International Politics of Climate Change. In this video, we're going to explore the related topics of climate security and the securitization of climate change. So let's get things underway then by first defining what we mean by security, and that'll help us to interpret and understand these uh, twin topics. I like the IR theorist Ole Weaver's definition of security. So he argues that security problems in international relations have traditionally been interpreted as problems that threaten the sovereignty or independence of a state. And these threats arise in particularly rapid or dramatic fashion, and they tend to deprive the state of the capacity to manage itself and undercut the existing political order. So these have to be sort of existential grave threats. And because they're such grave threats, they must therefore be met with the mobilization of maximum effort on behalf of the government uh, and occupy a place of primacy in the policy agenda. But with traditional security threats, there's always an enemy and that enemy becomes the rationale and the framing device for national security policy making and that overwhelming mobilization of public resources. But with climate change though, there is no traditional enemy. So this conundrum leads us to some interesting places as you're about to see. In this video, I'm gonna start out by looking at climate change as a security issue, and then I'll introduce the theory of securitization. I'll then problematize securitization in the context of climate change and introduce some non-traditional security approaches to climate security that might be more appropriate I'll finish up by looking at climate security through the lens of adaptation. So if we begin by putting our IR theory hat on for a moment, from a traditional national security perspective, security has been interpreted through the IR theory of realism. So recall our IR family tree from previous week's videos. From this point of view, states are considered the most important actors in an anarchic international system. So anarchy means there's no higher governing power. In this system, hard power for states is all important. So that means military power. Weak states do what they can and strong states do what they must in order to survive and thrive within this anarchic world order. Within this framework, security threats tend to count more if they're made against the state. And those kinds of threats usually, though not always, come from other states. So where does the earth fit in the realist security paradigm? Well, the earth really has always been integrated into security constructs of international relations, but as something that's assumed as fixed, as something in the background, or as the stage upon which the play of international affairs takes place. It's been integrated as an object rather than as something that's dynamic and interrelated. And we see this in the concept of geopolitics, which is something that's really co-evolved with realist theory through the 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, from a geopolitics perspective, the environment can contribute to a country's sense of security, for instance, through natural resource endowments or through geographic uh, expressions like mountain ranges that uh, help to insulate a country from attack in some quarters, or it can constrain a country's sense of security through geopolitical limitations. Like for example, if you're a country that's completely landlocked or conversely completely surrounded by ocean, that those geographic features can shape your strategic environment. Now we see this geopolitics perspective illustrated in the graphic here. What we see highlighted in this map are the key geostrategic spaces across the Eurasian landmass, as documented by some of the more imperial minded thinkers from the turn of the millennium. So people like Spigniew Brzezinski, uh, who was part of the American national security apparatus in the 1970s and 80s. And in this map, you can see the importance, importance that's given to geographic features like the oil and gas producing regions of the Middle East and Central Asia or maritime choke points, uh, or the areas where there's a lot of economic production going on. All of these things are important uh, expressions of ge geography. So this is where the earth comes into play uh, as part of the security discourse. 
Now, traditionally, it was pretty rare that changes to the natural world would register as a threat from this point of view. So in the past, for an environmental problem to be classified as a traditional security threat, it had to have some demonstrable connection to a vital national interest. Now, looking back historically, there weren't that many environmental problems that satisfied that criteria because environmental degradation tended to be localized or they tended to manifest as cumulative problems over long time horizons. And neither of these things constituted a direct threat to the core interests of states. And they didn't pose a direct challenge to the structure of economic and military power relations between states. But that was then, this is now. In the case of climate change, vital national interests are now under direct threat. So you know, through Pol 3 IPC, we're very well familiar now with the magnitude of climate vulnerability and climate risk. And consider this also. In 2019, the peak scientific body that monitors the UN Convention on Biodiversity, which is a sister treaty of the UNFCCC. So this body called the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPBES. So that's the counterpart of the IPCC. This body released a sobering report with the extraordinary warning that 1 million species are under direct threat of extinctions, many within decades and more than ever before in human history. And the real cherry on the cake was that it argued that humans are responsible for this mass extinction and that this loss of biodiversity is undercutting the ability of the Earth's ecosystems to support human life. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this would imply a direct existential threat to the security of all states and all people. Here's where the labeling of this existential threat through a national security lens comes into play. By labeling climate change as a security threat, we're positioning it as one of supreme priority. And this is securitization. This is what securitization is. And this is a concept that was developed by IR scholars of the Copenhagen School of IR theory. According to the Copenhagen School theorists, there are three criteria involved in the attempt to securitize an issue. First, the issue in question has to be framed as an existential threat. Second, because it's an existential threat, it demands extraordinary measures to address the problem over and above any policy measures that are already in place. So it's demanding additional mobilization of resources and attention. And finally, both policymakers and the public need to be convinced that these extraordinary measures are justified to address the existential threat. So that's our three core criteria for the securitization of any issue. Now, as we know, government responses to the existential threat of climate change have been so far underwhelming. They haven't been up to the magnitude of the task as warned in the scientific evidence. So there are interest groups that argue that climate change should be securitized. In other words, framed as a national security issue so that climate change can be bumped up the policy agenda of governments. And so that governments take the issue more seriously and act with this greater urgency that's required by the scientific evidence. Portraying climate change in this way, portraying it as a national security issue might help to raise its political profile and therefore the urgency and the amount of public expenditure that's likely to be dedicated to it. So we hear this securitizing rhetoric in things like a call for a World War II style mobilization for climate action, or when climate change is referred to as a threat multiplier. And I'll come back to that point later. So calling for climate change to, secure, to be securitized is therefore being a tactical choice by some organizations within the broader climate movement. But we have to emphasize securitization is about framing. It has more to do with the way that climate change is framed per se, rather than the dynamics of the climate change issue itself. However, it's not just from members of the climate movement that are asking for climate change to be securitized. We have seen securitizing rhetoric in relation to climate change at the international level. Climate change has been on the radar of the United Nations 
security apparatus, at least since 2007. And this is when it was first, de first debated in the UN Security Council. Since that time, there's been a handful of additional UN documents that have been tabled and official debates conducted in both the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. But if we look at the UN Security Council specifically, to have an issue debated in the Security Council, it has to present some demonstrable threat to international peace and security as articulated in Article 7 of the UN Charter. As we've seen previously, climate change is an all-encompassing problem that interacts with human systems in complex and diverse ways. So to have climate change debated in the Security Council, it was first necessary to frame the issue from a security perspective so that it met the criteria of threat to international peace and security. And this is where we see this, this itself is an act of securitization to frame climate change in that way. Let's put our critical thinking hats on for a moment and start problematizing the idea of securitization. So for one, the causality of transnational environmental threats like climate change is distinctly non-linear, as we discovered in week three. Responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions incorporates the current and historic policy choices of governments, as well as the activities of millions of businesses, as well as the behavioral behavioural choices of billions of people, all interacting with the geological, meteorological and biological processes of the, earth, of the Earth in a series of positive feedback loops. So you can see this in a in simple illustration in the simplified system diagram for water security that's shown here on the graphic. So even in this simplified form, there's clearly a lot of complexity to untangle in the interactions between humans and non-human systems. Within that causality, it's difficult to pin down who's responsible because there's multiple non-linear paths of responsibility that can't be easily or directly assigned to any one state. So if you're taking a national security perspective where you're looking for external threats, largely from other states, it's very difficult to do that from a complex systems perspective. Now, securitizing rhetoric traditionally has been most powerful when there's an enemy other to rally against. But in the case of climate change, indeed, you could say that the enemy is us, the enemy is everyone. And this undercuts the othering logic of traditional securitization. I can hear some of you saying, what about resource wars? And indeed, fears about resource-based competition and conflict are a legitimate question to raise, given the gravity of predictions about global warming trajectories for the coming century. And I have to admit, this is a question that got me researching climate security back in the mid 2000s. Now, when the environment first started getting traction in security studies back in the early 1990s, it was in the context of resource scarcity. So this really, these, these studies provided a modern day reinterpretation of the work of the English demographer Thomas Malthus back in the 18th century. So Malthus argued that population growth would eventually outpace a country's food supply and lead to a strain on food and resources. In the modern derivation of this theory, scarcities, like resources, scarcities of resources like oil and water or arable land are seen as potential drivers of conflict. So this is what's known as the environmental conflict discourse. And it's closely linked to the state-centric traditional security paradigm. So there's a heavy national security overlay here. And the state is still the core unit of analysis. So to illustrate this, check out this map on the slide here. This is a map of global water insecurity hotspots, which is published by the NGO New Climate for Peace. So from an environmental conflict perspective, this is where you'd expect to see emerging conflict in a climate constrained world, at least around water. From an environmental conflict perspective, we also see climate change described as a threat multiplier, which interacts with the pre-existing socioeconomic and political problems that are already there in states, and that this can drive insecurity in ways that make those problems worse. 
So problems such as poverty or the availability of weapons, ethnic tensions, external indebtedness, forced migration, weak institutional capacity, or low state legitimacy. So all of these things, all of these are likely to be made worse as climate change increases the likelihood of conflict scenarios. And according to this view, violent conflict is most likely to be triggered by climate change overwhelmingly within the most vulnerable states. However, if we're looking ahead to a Mad Max style future of apocalyptic climate wars, we are making some pretty heroic assumptions that might not necessarily be valid. So for one, we're assuming that resource competition inevitably leads to conflict. Now, while there is some evidence of this in terms of fossil fuels, the picture is much more rosy when it comes to water competition, where it seems that cooperative management of shared international water resources is the norm rather than competition. On the graphic here, you can see a map of all of the different transboundary river basins, and almost all of these have an international treaty that helps govern them. If we're thinking Mad Max, we're also assuming that global cooperation on climate change through the UNFCCC will have completely broken down. Now, while we have every reason to criticize the UNFCCC process for its glacial pace of action, its long-term trajectory is also towards greater cooperation. So while the threat multiplier effect of climate change is definitely a thing, I don't want to underplay that, fears over dystopian resource wars might be a little more far-fetched. Let's come back to our old friend Ole Weaver from the Copenhagen School, who warns us that in addition to identifying the who or what that presents the threat, we also need to ask whether a phenomenon should be treated in terms of security. And this is a really important question to ask in terms of securitizing climate change discourse. And a securitized response may not always be the most appropriate adaptive response to climate vulnerabilities. It is important to note that the policies and adaptations required to ensure human security is largely the jurisdiction of civilian institutions and not militaries. So it's a holistic problem. It's not just a military problem. And as we saw last week, building adaptive capacity and resilience is a holistic whole of society endeavor. You just can't bomb your way to climate resilience. Securitization can lead to costly militarization strategies. It can lead to unnecessary insecurity spirals between states due to militarization. And it can lead to misinvestment in maladaptive military-based strategies that address the symptoms of climate impacts and hazards rather than their root causes. Securitization has some other dangers as well. So we know that security threats are usually judged by publics to have sufficient gravity and urgency to give them priority over other calls upon government expenditure. And this is a phenomenon, this is the rally around the flag phenomenon. And national leaders can definitely take advantage of this tendency for their own political ends. Ole Weaver warns us that national leaders can try to use securitizing language to gain control over a policy area or a problem. The extraordinary resources that are reserved for issues of national security cuts both ways. So while it, it may bump an issue up the policy agenda of government, it also gives governments the authority to reduce transparency and to increase official secrecy around the issue. Securitization can centralize decision-making on an issue within the national security bureaucracy, which for an all-encompassing complex whole of society problem like climate change would really narrow the framing of the issue as well as the menu of choice for govern, government action available to address it. And this could be quite maladaptive. Now, this isn't to say at all that militaries and the national security establishment should have no role in climate change response. Quite the opposite, in fact. Militaries do play an important role in contingency planning and response for natural disaster events. And if you're predicting more frequent and intense climate related disaster events, then this is clearly an important role for the military. Militaries are great at rapid mobilization and logistics, which make them really well suited for this kind of crisis response. There's also likely to be greater demand for humanitarian interventions in neighboring countries, 
where weak governance and civil violence are exacerbating climate shocks. Of course, climate change isn't happening in a vacuum. There are still traditional security threats and there is still great power competition, all of which governments have to strategize and prepare for. So the big question that policymakers have to face is, what's the appropriate role for their military in a climate changed world? And this question isn't an easy question to answer. There are other approaches to climate security that are more holistic than the traditional national security paradigm. And they work from different assumptions about who is being secured and from what, and they offer a different menu of policy choice to policymakers. The complex causality and the transnational scope of global climate change presents problems for security analysis and governance. As we can see on the map here at the bottom, National borders really are artificial creations of human politics, and they don't correspond with the distribution of the Earth's different bioregions and ecosystems. They're lines on a map, but they're important lines on a map because this has implications for how environmental threats are understood and how they're addressed through political processes. So just even looking at a map like this, we can see that global environmental problems like climate change present a paradox for the idea of state sovereignty. And this is something that greatly complicates the global response to climate mitigation and adaptation. So shifting our core assumptions about security can take us to different places in examining climate change from a security perspective. So if we shift our point of reference from the state to individual people as our frame of reference, this brings us to the human security paradigm. So from a human security perspective, harmful disruptions to human well-being are what lie at the heart of the underlying reasons why conflict occurs. A lack of physical safety and a lack of secure access to food or water or housing and employment or even healthcare, these are things that present insecurities to individual people. Now this was first articulated in 1994 by the UN Development Programme which first articulated eight different dimensions of human security. And these are illustrated here in a circular graphic. If we think about who specifically, you know, in the, the frame of government that would address human insecurities, part of it's the national security apparatus, but most of it is around other areas of public policy. So this is usually the jurisdiction of civilian institutions. And this is where we see stable governments come into the picture because the weakness or failure or absence of other government services is a real feature of low adaptive capacity and this exacerbates climate vulnerability. There's other paradigms we can draw from as well. So for example, feminist IR theory disrupts dominant assumptions about what is in the national interest and what deserves to be securitized. As an outgrowth of feminist IR theory, the key insight from feminist environmental security discourses is that environmental degradation cuts across other axes of disempowerment to create unique insecurities for individuals based on their unique life circumstances. And here we can pay particular attention to the unique security situations of women. Whereas in other security discourses, the unique challenges faced by women is largely uh, absent from the discussion. It's invisible, not so here. Now this perspective also leads to a, re a rejection of the governmentality approach to top-down institutionalized environmental governance, uh, as well as a, a rejection of the dominant institutional and societal structures that contribute to some of the root causes of environmental insecurity with particular critique of the national security state. Feminist environmental security also considers potential solutions that reject these dominant institutional structures. Ontologically, feminist approaches internalize the interdependent relationship between humans and non-human species. So it's not anthropocentric, there's space for the non-human in here which doesn't really count in other interpretations of security.
Feminist approaches draw on multiple sources of knowledge, including survivor testimonies and including the traditional knowledge systems of First Nations peoples. Again, it's incorporating the life experiences and the testimonies of people and groups who've been traditionally invisible in other security discourses. So we can see that this is very much a bottom up discourse on climate security that brings underrepresented voices to the fore. But I think the most intriguing development in IR theory around security comes from complex systems. Now you've heard me talk a lot about developing a systems understanding of global climate politics. So complex systems theories, these have emerged from the hard sciences, but they're incre increasingly being applied to international relations and across the social sciences more broadly. So from this perspective, international politics is not just how the discrete entities like states and institutions and other actors connect with each other, but rather about how the global community as a whole exists as an emergent interconnected system. And this system is highly connected through trade flows, energy networks, population movements, communication technologies, and yes, all of that is interwoven with the Earth's ecosystems, which we're inevitably integrated within. Because of these networked interconnections, what we see as international relations is an emergent outcome of all of these complex networked connect connections. And it's not just the relationships between actors in the international system that's important. It's how, how these relationships work as a whole system itself that's of interest. So if we're looking at climate security from a complex systems perspective, then ecosystem resilience is really the name of the game. A healthy ecosystem exists in balance. And all of the constituent organisms, all of the constituent species within ecosystems play a role in maintaining that balance. And that includes human beings. Conversely, if one part of an ecosystem is damaged or if species are killed off from that ecosystem, then the entire ecosystem suffers because all of those constituent organisms are connected. If we look at the basic ecosystem diagram that's depicted here on the slide, if you damage any one element of that system, everything else in turn in the system suffers. But if all of the elements are healthy and in balance, then the system is resilient and it's more secure against environmental shocks like disaster events and climate change impacts. So successful approaches to climate security from this perspective, create conditions where the physical surroundings of human communities provide for the needs of human inhabitants as well as non-human inhabitants and increase the health and resilience of the ecosystems in which they sit. Or to put it more crudely, you just don't shit where you eat. This is not hard. So best practice approaches to climate change adaptation and mitigation are based on this interpretation of ecological resilience from a complexity perspective. So if we're looking to give a name to this sort of complex systems security discourse in climate change, we can call it the ecological security discourse. Now an ecological security approach ascribes political significance to non-human entities and to ecosystems. And it notes that environmental destruction is often stemmed from traditional approaches to security that kill off non-human entities and that damage ecosystems. So ecological security is about the ecosystem itself as the reference point. It's the security of the ecosystems that count. If the ecosystem as a whole is secure, then the species that comprise that ecosystem, including humans, will also be secure. And if one part of the ecosystem is damaged or killed off, then the entire ecosystem suffers. But ecological security isn't just about the environmental impacts of militaries. From this perspective, economic development itself creates ecological insecurity through its destruction of ecosystems and its creation of pollution across entire production chains. The loss of resilience in degraded ecosystems places all of the species within those ecosystems at risk, including humans, as the IPBES report that I mentioned earlier starkly points out. 
But this is why climate politics has proven so difficult and divisive, because the enemy is us. Now, when I talk about us, you know, when there is a variation in responsibility and vulnerability between people and between states, but all humans are enmeshed in these social and productive systems that are responsible for generating the problem. So that's what I mean by the enemy is us. To conclude, I want to come back to where we started at the beginning of this video and where we left off from last week with adaptation. The most fruitful way to understand climate change as a security threat is to look at it through the lens of adaptation, because this is where the best responses to addressing those security threats can be found. Climate change does produce security risks, risk to the international system, risk to states, and risk to humans and non-humans alike. Building adaptive capacity and building climate resilience is really the best strategy for reducing these security risks associated with climate change. And that's done through the capacity building measures we explored in week six. This is the basis of the best practice adaptation strategies. And it's this understanding of IR that's the basis for the emerging Earth-based governance models, which we'll come back to again in week 11. There is a role for militaries but they have a specific role within the broader adaptive response.